is that they they not only have energy but they also have momentum. Now traditionally, classically, momentum is equal to mass times velocity. But we said that a photon is a massless particle; its mass is zero, so how can it have momentum? Well, this definition of momentum it applies to uh, to classical particles, uh, but in terms of relativity and, and quantum mechanics, uh, we define momentum as being h times frequency over c. That is the momentum of a particle, uh, which we could also say is h over lambda, because lambda is equal to c over f. Uh, so that is how we find the momentum of a photon of light. So when a, a light particle hits something, you know, it, it imparts some momentum to that. There's a collision, you know, that sort of thing. Um, there's one uh, one potential application of this that hasn't hasn't really been used yet, but are light sails. They've talked about uh, potentially using uh, creating a large sail essentially uh, and attaching it to uh, a a, uh, a some kind of spaceship and then using the the momentum from light sources to to push to propel the uh, the spaceship to wherever it's going. Uh, it's something that NASA is looking into. Um, another application, this one's already in use, uh, is using what are called optical tweezers. Uh, they have these things that you can, they, they, they use, they're used to manipulate uh, bacteria and DNA, but essentially you just have, uh, you know, tweezers kind of look like this, and you squeeze it together and pinch something in between. Well, instead of actually squeezing something together, you just have like a laser that runs between these two. So if something is small enough, you can just turn on the laser and then there's, uh, because this, this laser is hitting and then there's some object that it's holding in between, like a strand of DNA, say, helix, like pretend that's a helix. <laughs> there's a strand of DNA in the middle of this, so then there's some force this way, some force this way, and it kind of holds the the strand uh, in place as you you know pull it around. So that, those are uh, applications of momentum. Now, an important occurrence that happens because of conservation of momentum and of energy uh, is it's called the Compton effect. And essentially, it's a collision between an X-ray uh, photon and, uh, and an electron. Now, the reason that it's an X-ray is because you know uh, something with a longer wavelength might not even you know in interact with an electron at all, uh, but an X-ray it it will do so. Uh, I need to zoom this out a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Collision between an X-ray photon and an electron. Now in this, this is essentially the the same idea as but previously when we had you know one ball was rolling along and one other was at rest and they collided and you know went off in different directions and momentum is conserved because there are no net external forces acting on the system. Uh, and in the Compton effect, a collision between a, a photon and an electron energy is also conserved. So there are several equations that we can write related to this, this interaction between the two particles. So initial energy is just this photon moving so our E naught is just H times the frequency of the photon. Okay, um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put a naught there. Now the final energy, the photon scatters off, but something interesting happens is that this photon gives some of its energy to the electron, which means if it's losing energy, energy is only related to frequency. So that means that its frequency changes uh, so we call this f prime because it's the new frequency of the photon, and then this the uh, electron then has some kinetic energy, uh, and so those are the initial and final energies. So we can say the initial energy of the photon is equal to the final energy of the photon plus the kinetic energy of the electron. So that's one of our equations, uh, and then momentum is conserved, right? And we can write our conservation of momentum in both the x and y directions. We're going to assume that this is 
initially moving in the x direction. So let's see, this is energy. This is momentum in the x direction. Initially, this photon has momentum uh, h over lambda. And then we're going to assume that the photon scatters off at some angle theta, and the x-ray, or is the, sorry, the x-ray is the, the photon, the x-ray scatters off at some angle theta, and the electron scatters off at some angle phi. Okay, so then the final momentum of the, or the final x-momentum of the photon, well, its momentum is h over lambda prime, whatever, excuse me, its new wavelength is. Uh, so that's the total momentum of the photon. So we have this vector is h over lambda prime. Well, the x component of that is just h over lambda prime times cosine theta. Uh, and then the electron has some momentum, momentum of electron, also times cosine of phi. In the y direction, there is initially no momentum. So we can say 0 equals the y momentum of our x-ray, which is just h over lambda sine theta, and then the y momentum of the electron, which is that momentum sine phi, but as we've drawn this, this is going below the horizontal, so that's a minus. And so then these are our three equations that kind of uh, govern the Compton effect, that govern these collisions. Now, doing some math with these and playing around with, we skipped over the section on relativity uh, because it's not on the AP test. Uh, but relat in, in relativity, uh, kinetic energy is redefined uh, in terms of, uh, because it's affected also by how close the speed is to the speed of light. It's not just half mv squared, as it is classically, but there's a factor that has to do with how close it is to the speed of light. Momentum is similarly redefined. And so uh, just saying that, if you plug in those relativistic definitions and do some math, you figure out that the wavelength, uh, the change in wavelength of the x-ray, that is its you know, final wavelength minus its initial wavelength, is equal to this quantity. Uh, uh, it's that. <laughs> so it's h, which is uh, Planck's constant, over the mass of the electron times c, uh, both of, all of these are on your formula sheets, uh, times 1 minus cosine theta. Right? So you can see when theta equals 0, you know, that would be the case of the photon continuing on in a straight path, which means it hasn't collided. So if that's theta is 0, then cosine theta is 1, and we have no change in wavelength. That makes sense, because theta is 0, that means there was no collision. And we have the maximum change in wavelength if theta is 180. If the photon bounces straight back, it gives the most energy to this electron, and therefore it, it loses the most energy. Uh, and so then its wavelength uh, changes by the most significant amount, because cosine of 180 is negative 1, which means that the change in wavelength would be 2 times h times mass of electron times c. Uh, and as it turns out, that is the greatest change in wavelength that can that can occur uh, when this thing collides with an electron. If Say you were colliding with a proton instead, you could just throw in mass of the proton and momentum proton, momentum proton, it works, and it works just as well, or neutron, or whatever. Uh, and these equations work just as well for other particles as well. Uh, the Compton effect is important in uh, radio biology, which is a kind of a fancy word, <laughs> uh, but what, what radio biology is, uh, it has to do with you know applying radiation to living tissue, uh, and these are you know the way this models the way that X rays and gamma rays interact with with the atoms in living tissue, uh, and so that's important in in terms of uh, radiation therapy, like chemotherapy uh, used in cancer treatment, and also just for for uh, taking X rays and how and how those, those X-ray images are formed. So that's you know, an application of the Compton effect in uh, a place where it's important.